Hello, I'm Demis Helen, and welcome back to the Melodic Techno series for Keybase 12 Pro. This is the final episode, episode number four, where we're going to be looking at how the project was mixed. I've used Pink Noise, but there's a few tips and tricks in here that I use to make sure that I get nice warmth, punch and clarity from the mix. And just before we get started, so as a reference point, we're using bar 33 through 49 for this, and that is where our respawn bass changes are happening, and that's to demonstrate the first part of my chain. And then we're going to revert back to bar 17 through 33. So we've got a more static portion of the track to show you what I'm doing with the other stuff. And in this particular mix, if we just go back to our arranger view, you can see that there's a pink noise track at the top here. And if we click on here, you can see that I've got a test generator as an insert on an audio track and I'm using the pink noise and I've got it set to minus nine. So I work at the minus nine level. You may work at minus 12, 18, maybe even six. That's absolutely fine. You do what you need to do and what works best for you. And the basic premise is once I unmute that pink noise, I will start balancing each track soloed till you can just barely hear it over the white noise. And that is meant to give you a nice representation of how the human hearing works and it'll give you a nice balanced mix. So it does work, uh, but I do a few things that sort of sway away from just keeping it at that level. I, I mix my kick and bass a little bit louder than the white noise so I can hear it a bit more indefinite and I do it with leads as well just to sort of make them pop a little bit more and then everything else is sort of seated quite nicely around that then. Okay, so let's start by having a look at the insert channel for the stereo out here. So the master out, I have two multi bands. So let's just open each one, bring them across. So what's happening here is we have a multi band compressor and a multiband expander. So I'm compressing the kick or the region the kick is in, and I'm expanding the bass region, so the more boxy area. So you can see I'm not using these three bands, so we could technically bypass these, so you can visually see the bands that I'm not using, like this. So you can see if they were combined, you can see I'm using two bands, the first two. And the premise here is to control the kick and the bass, so give presence to the bass, especially in a mono environment, vitally important for a lot of these mono speakers and phones, etc. that still sort of work in a mono capacity. And the kick is for controlling the boom. So on the compressor part, I'm controlling the low end of the kick, even though it is the full spectrum up to 150 Hertz there, you can tune that to how you need it to be in your track. But this is just compressing that low end part and then expanding the sort of lower mids of the bass to give it presence. And in turn, that is going to control your low end quite nicely. You don't want to overdo it with the compression and same for the expansion, to be honest, but it's not as drastic as the compression because if you compress that too much, you're going to reduce the kick to a very weak, thin sound, and you don't want to really do that to your mix. You just want to sort of take the edge off the sort of real fatness of the kick if you're not looking for that fatness in your track. So with this being melodic techno and house sort of combined, this needs to have more control on the low end. In my opinion, that was how I wanted to approach the mix from the beginning. So the kick is quite sharp and quite tactful in the mix. So this is going to be probably quite difficult to hear. So I am going to solo the kick and bass channel. So we're just hearing that. Looking at the compressor first, you're going to hear that the kick is going to get rounder. It's going to get probably a little bit warmer than what it currently is. It sounds quite thin. Um, and that is because I have compressed the kick here, which is going to reduce, like I said earlier, its sort of width. It's going to make it sound thinner. Um, I've actually boosted this by 0.7 dB there just to bring it back up to a sort of acceptable level before it goes through my three stage mastering chain. So I'm going to turn this on and off a couple of times so you can hear. Um, make sure you're using headphones for this one. You might be able to hear it on monitors, but if you're watching on a laptop or a phone or anything, just make sure you've got some headphones so you can sort of hear the changes. So 
it's very subtle in its approach, but it does just add that little bit of warmth and rounds the kick off, but without making it too boomy because we're controlling that low end. And moving on to the expander now, the bass, I'm going to leave that kick one on so it's now on that compressor, but the expander is now going to give presence to the bass and it's going to enhance that grittiness, but more importantly, it's going to sort of weave it into the track, but put it on top so it's present and up front, but it's not going to sound like we've just plonked it on top and everything sort of sat below it and it's just masking everything. It's going to be sort of nicely woven in. We can see that it's the same premise. We're using the second band here because we're covering from 100 to around, so 713 hertz, we'd have to say around, and that is controlling the presence of the bass, so the low mids to the mids of that bass, giving it a lot of presence. The same premise down here, some compression, we have fall and rise, very similar to attack and release, and you can see I've boosted the output there by nearly 2 dB. So I'm going to play this again for you if you're struggling to hear it again, listen to this on headphones because it's going to be best heard that way. This is expanding the bass and if you hear the initial hit and then when the filter closes and holds that sort of filter cutoff point uh, before the next note hits, you'll hear that that's the part that really sort of expands and doesn't disappear into the mix like it does when this is off. So when it's off, it'll sort of sit at that level and it sort of tails off, whereas with it on, it's going to sort of maintain its height and its, its presence. Another good way of looking at that is we're trying to bring the level of the quieter part closer to the louder part, but without changing the filter position, if that makes sense. And it just gives it more presence. And combined with the kick being slightly compressed, we get a nice sort of balance between the kick and bass. And you'll have to fine tune this for each track. This is not going to be how you set it up for each one. Um, it's going to be totally unique to each track. Okay, so I'm going to repeat the first part here that I mentioned where we've just got the sort of static bass position. And if we jump into the mixer, I'm going to show you the three parts that I use for this mix. So I've kept these relatively simple, so it's easy for you to understand because I've kept the track build quite simple. Um, the actual sort of final stages should be simple too. So first is first is the EQ, and I'm using the Studio EQ for this. And you can see I've made some minute changes. And just to point out at this stage, if you are making big boosts and big cuts in your mix, you really need to sort of revisit the problem areas of your track. You're going to have to go through and solo each channel and see which one is the offending track causing the issue that you're having to rectify at the mastering stage. We should not be making huge moves at this point. So if you're doing something like this, you need to go back to the production stage or the mixing stage and rectify by isolating the track that is in question causing that issue. So again, take a listen. I'm using this with spectrum mode off because I don't want to see any visuals. I just want to be able to use my ears and this is a good way to go about it. So you can hear that bit just adds so much more depth to the track, even though we've only done a 1.6 dB boost, it's breathing so much life into the kick and bass and just bringing the sort of life back out after the uh, multiband compression that we've done on the low end. Next in the chain is the vintage compressor and this one is to bring out subtle nuances in the track um, and really sort of just to add a final glue to the mix. 
and the vintage compressor is modeled after the 1176. We've got some fixed ratios and we've also got a fixed threshold and we just drive the input and then balance it with the output. And we've just got some basic controls in the middle. So it's great for drum buses and things like that. You've got the punch control, but it's also good for mastering to, like I said before, to bring out subtle nuances and just sort of glue the mix together quite nicely. And you can see I'm going for a gain reduction of between one, so minus one and minus two. So we're in that sort of ballpark there. So you can see that is very subtle. We've got the mix at 100% there, so you could do a bit of parallel if you wanted to, but um, I'm going for that full sound. So very simple, not trying to do anything overboard, very minute tweaks, very low settings, very low gain reduction at that stage. Moving on, we have Razor. So let's bring this over. And Razor is a limiter and it is one of the newer limiters in Cubase and it works really well. We've got some nice visuals and some nice options as well to get the mix working without any obvious digital clipping and distortion. So just a quick word of warning, make sure that your headphone level is turned down before you listen to this next part because we are going to boost this by 8 dB, well 9 dB there, and it's going to be quite loud. So you can see from that we've got a little bit of reduction happening there it's doing its job and it's just making sure that we're getting no digital clipping and distortion happening in our final boost so that brings us to the end of our three stage mastering chain there so if we take a look at what we've just done in summary we've got our compression on our multibands and our expansion on our multiband for the kick and bass so we can better balance them and give presence to the bass especially in those mid areas where we struggle to hear them on phones and small speakers and stuff like that then we've gone into the studio eq where we've made some very small adjustments to complement the track and again, if you're making big moves at this stage with the EQ, review your track, review your mixing, and find the culprit that's causing the problem. Very gentle processing on our compressor. So typically two to one ratio is the best for mastering. You don't want to start making the compressor be heard at this stage. You want it to be very transparent. And you can see these settings are suited for the track. But experiment again by driving it harder so you can hear exactly what it's doing then bring it back to a very low level so you can hear exactly how it is working. And finally, Razor bringing that level up, making sure that we are keeping our ceiling below zero dB and making sure we can push it as loud as we can. And for those eagle-eyed viewers, just before we finish, we've got a mono to stereo plugin here. This is just for testing my mix in mono. I can just quickly activate this on and off. I can sort of like leave it in the corner. You can use control room. There's some other plugins that you can use as well. Um, but I just like to use this because you can switch pretty quickly. I'll just give you a quick demonstration here of how that's working. And that's the way that I'm checking that the track is sort of operating correctly in the mono environment as well. Um, if you're getting things a little bit too wide, for example, the bass is out of phase, you're sort of going to hear that disappear when you turn it into mono. So it's a good way to sort of test your mix back and forth. 
a lot of people make their entire mixes in mono. It depends on your workflow. Um, I just tend to switch this on and off as I'm actually working. So there we have it. That brings us to the end of the Melodic Techno series. It's been great to have you on board and hopefully it's opened up some doors and avenues for you to build and create Melodic Techno for yourself in Cubase 12 Pro. Don't forget, the project is available for download so you can take a deeper dive into it or even expand upon the project. And with that said, thank you very much for watching. I've been Demis Helen and I will look forward to seeing you in future videos. Take care.